that is from the Latin theater called the Bali. Oh, really? It's from the director is a good friend of mine. He started the program. Uh, you're the other one. Yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry, yeah, yeah, I don't know. Um, it's, uh, yeah, last year, no, uh, two years ago, I think, they, they presented my, my, my film uh, where there's a section about refugees and so on. So, uh, it's not a documentary about Christian refugees in Germany. Yeah, it's pretty nice. Okay, nee, ich weiß nicht mehr. Ja, da warten wir noch, warten wir noch zwei Minuten, oder? Okay. Ja, ja, wir müssen ja, wir müssen nicht zu lange warten, ne? Ja? Ja, okay. Ja. Ja. Noch gar nicht mehr, genau. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, here in the city of Bonn, in the former German Bundestag, to the second day of the REN21 Academy, and welcome all over the world in our live stream. Yesterday, um, a lot of people were watching and listening, so hello, uh, wherever you are, at what time it is. Here it is about 10 a.m. in uh, Germany, and since we are on the Rhineland, it's a very, very special day because it's the 11th of November. So for all of you who are not from Cologne or Bonn or some other carnival capitals in Germany, it's the highest religion day in, um, in, in Cologne and Bonn because it's the start of the carnival today. Yeah, that he already gets, <laughs> Rainer already tries to get, get, <laughs> uh, get, get, loses his tie, don't worry, you know. Uh, the day um, where women are allowed to, to cut the ties of men is um, in February, but today at 11, 11 uh, a.m. and 11 minutes, so 11, 11, on the 11th of um, November, it's the start of the carnival. So, of course, since we are very intercultural, we try to participate. And I will teach you now the um, uh, Cologne slogan yeah, in Carnival. You have to say in Rhineland, so you can use it tonight in your hotel, so everybody will love you. Uh, and it's easy. It's like, I will say Kölle, which means Cologne, yeah, in, you know, and you have to say Alaf, like it's, it's similar to I laugh. It's uh, spelled A-L-A-A-F, and nobody knows what it means, so don't ask me. But it's been just, you know, party life. So I say, we, 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 we try to do it right now. I say, Kölle, and you say, Alaf. Okay, again, Kölle, Alaf. Again, Kölle, Alaf. Ah, that's good. Okay, at 11, 11, yeah, Christina has to point out, yeah, we all have to try that. Okay, thank you very much. Sec yeah. It's 10, 11, so it's only one hour to go. And for the international um, audience all over the live stream, you can try to do it as well and send us some selfies. Ah, by the way, talking about the selfies, so videos, yeah, we will publish, right, Christina? If they have some color allowed things from all over the world, yeah, yeah, that's already a campaign, isn't it, Kelly? <laughs> For REN21, um, bunking the myth, uh, not debunking. Okay, um, about the selfies, I told you yesterday about the uh, um, photos and, 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 and photographer. Um, first of all, uh, people who didn't have taken a photo yet, you, you're still able to do that during your lunch break, and all the photos will be. Uh, you will find these selfies we made of you uh, on the wall, but it's not, don't pick them up and bring them, bring them home, but we want, as a, as a part of a networking thing, that you know each other, take these photos, that there will be another wall, you will see that in, the, in, the, in our coffee room, and take your photo, pin it to the wall, to the other wall, wherever you like, 
and um, sign um, and write something beneath. It can be like um, a love letter or a remark or a question or something about you, your CV, or maybe a slogan or what you always wanted to tell the world, tell it to us. Um, since we are here together, so that we have, in the end, we have like a big wall, not a Berlin wall, but a Bonn wall, but a nice wall with your photos and, and your remarks and your um, personal notes uh, to, towards our, our uh, academy or towards the others, or maybe some leave the mobile number, everything's possible, <laughs> if you like to. Okay, and thirdly, um, yeah, yesterday all the groups in the month in our, in our game who, has, who have lost and not won, um, you know, this is what you should know today and read it and learn it by heart. Christina already noted yesterday who didn't know all the facts and data from it. No, I'm joking. But today, of course, in the afternoon, we will have um, a second game, a second quiz, second chance for all of you to win. Uh, for the ones who haven't been here yesterday, just let... Um, just yourself surprised by what's going to happen in the afternoon. All right, so this was um, for today. Um, the things I wanted to, to um, say um, in advance. Now um, I have the um, great chance and honor to um, introduce Kelly Rick to you, our keynote speaker about our um, first panel today. She came from Amsterdam, speaks fluently um, 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 Dutch. So, good day, thank you well. The panel is yours, Kelly. Thank you. So I come at this issue from a campaigner's background. So unlike most of you, I presume here, I'm not a policy expert. So the, the presentation I'm going to give you is a, based on about 30 plus years of campaigning. So when I was asked to talk about the issue of debunking myths about renewables in the media, it occurred to me that myths really has two meanings. It's the most obvious meaning, the notion that there is just wrong information about renewables out there. But there's also another meaning. The myths are the stories that we tell ourselves to make sense of the world. You know, they're the stories that we base our lives on, that reflect our um, deepest uh, personal beliefs and values. And I think that in order to understand why this persistently wrong information persists in the media, we have to look at it in the, in the context of this cultural mythology. So for the last hundred years or so, our industrial society has been based on a myth that, renewable, um, that fossil fuels have led to prosperity. So this ad, this is from Mobile Oil from 1975, the year of energy action. I won't tell you the story how I happened upon this ad recently. But if you read the main points, it really is the same narrative. It hasn't changed in 40 years. To fuel the economy, we need to provide new jobs and need action to find and develop new supplies of energy within the US. We need to cut the red tape, encourage investment. But I think the, the last point, this issue that we think most people understand this and believe as we do, that has changed in the last 40 years. We're at a point now where that mythology is starting to break down. You know, the, the whole question of the environmental impacts, land degradation, water degradation, climate change, health impacts, security impacts, they're introducing new storylines into this mythology. And at the same time, the new myth, our new uh, founding mythology that's based on clean air and clean energy and clean jobs and a safe climate, that hasn't taken root yet. So what we're seeing really is a clash of mythologies, uh, a, a, a sort of a, a discord between them. And when I talk about clashing mythologies, what I'm really talking about here is a culture war. So this you can see from um, the kinds of stories that the mainstream media is telling about renewables. The story that the fossil fuel industry, the, the people who prefer to protect the status quo are telling. Um, it really, like any good story, has, has good versus evil. There are heroes versus villains. You would you know, be forgiven from reading these um, headlines that renewable energy is going to damage our health, our environment. It's going to leave us shivering in the dark. Uh, it's going to leave poor countries you know, stranded in energy poverty, um, that we're going to go bankrupt, et cetera. So that's the story that they're telling. And these stories are designed to make us fear change. 
And if you think this isn't an intentional thing, you'd be wrong. It is very much a product of a well-designed and well-orchestrated and well-financed strategy by the part of those who want to preserve the status quo. This article just came out in the last week, and it was a rare glimpse behind the curtain of exactly how that strategy is playing out. This energy lobbyist, Richard Berman, was caught taped uh, speaking to a group of oil and gas industry executives in which he basically said, you can win ugly or lose pretty. You should think of this as an endless war. He said you have to budget for it. And the tactics that he advocated included um, telling stories to make people fear and mistrust the stories of uh, environmental groups. So this is really what we're up against. But not all of the uh, misinformation about renewables is as blatant as that. You look at this article in the Wall Street Journal, and remember the Wall Street Journal is a, a Murdoch publication. Um, you know, six myths about renewable energy, the impact on jobs and other assumptions just don't hold up anymore. So they sound like one of us, but already by myth number two, talking about how renewables can't place fossil fuels. So the story is, you know, yeah, they're, they're really nice in this niche little market, but don't worry, fossil fuels aren't going away anytime soon. So basically they perpetuate that myth by pretending to be the good guys. You know, in, in my experience working on this issue, there's really four types of journalists, and apologies if there are any journalists in the audience. You, you're obviously in this last category I'll refer to, but the first ones are the ones who do know better and who intentionally mislead the, the Murdochs of the world. The second category is probably the majority of, of journalists, of desk editors, of you know, current affairs presenters, those sorts of people for whom about, you know, like climate and energy make up about 1% of their daily lives. They just don't have the information. And they're probably ref reflecting their own views, their own biases, or those of their station or network or whoever they're employed by. The third category are the ones who know better but who somehow get it wrong anyway. And the fourth category are the ones who really do know what they're talking about and report it correctly. And that fourth category is such a small uh, percentage of the total that the result is that the public is actually misinformed. This recent poll conducted by the Energy and Climate Intelligence Unit in the UK showed that 80% of people in the UK support renewables. Only about 5% actively oppose it. And yet only 5% of the public actually knows this. Two thirds, nearly two thirds of the public believe that a majority of the public is opposed to renewables. And I think the, the interesting about this is it shows exactly what I was talking before about this, this clash in, um, in cultures at this stage. Because on the one hand, we're doing a great job. 80% of the people support renewables. But on the other hand, they don't know that. And the other side has managed to create this sense of you know, misapprehension that they don't support it. So there's a lot of confusion out there. And I think that one of the, the problems that we have within our community is that we believe because we've talked it about it so much, so much amongst ourselves, and we've put out really great reports and things. We think the public really understands it already or that they're is somehow as passionate as we are about it, but they're not. Being right is just not enough. And if you look uh, at, at our story, so we've heard about how they're telling their story. How does our story appear in the media? Now, I just did a quick Google search, and this isn't, this isn't obviously a comprehensive research thing. It's just what comes up in the Google search rankings. What are the top stories? Well, you see that the stories that come up about, that, that debunk those myths or tell the real story about renewables are coming either in publications that are progressive, that are on side, um, that are sort of niche, or they're in the kind of policy, renewable, uh, renewable energy finance stories, whatever. They're not really breaking through to a large degree in the mainstream media. And I, I fear that we run the risk sometimes of, of talking to ourselves. So what we really need is a communication strategy. We need to approach this, as I've su suggested as my orientation, like a campaign. You need to think about who needs to hear the, the message, where, when, at what moments. How are they best going to do that? And I think we need to talk about what are the features in a, of an effective communication strategy, because quite often people think if they put out a press release or a Q&A or a messaging document that that's a communication strategy. But it's not. There's a lot of things that go, that go into that. 
Um, and it, it, I mean, that could be a whole topic for a day's discussion in and of itself. So I'm just going to touch on a, a few highlights, first being that it's more than a media plan. It's not just about press releases and press conferences. The more senses that you can engage in your communication strategy, the more likely the message is, to, is likely to, to reach home. For example, a, a photo can communicate in a way that words never do. Secondly, I think it's important to remember that a good communication strategy fosters dialogue. Studies show that some of the most um, exciting uh, stories, the, the discourse where, that's really happening on this issue is happening around kitchen tables, amongst friends, amongst colleagues, amongst family members. People very rarely change their minds uh, as, as a result of being preached at or lectured to. A good communication strategy tells a story. We live in a storytelling culture, and our brains are hardwired to remember stories. Now, any American child would look at those four pictures and know that it's the story of Little Red Riding Hood. I don't, you may have it in your countries as well, in Dutch it's Rode Kapje. I don't know, there's probably a, a German equivalent. It's the story of the little girl who goes to visit her grandmother, and the wolf is dressed up like the grandmother, and, um, planning to eat the child, the, big, the hunter comes and kills the big bad wolf and they all live happily ever after. And I won't get into the mythology around wolves in children's stories and what that's done to the wolf population. That's a completely different conversation. But the fact is, you look at those four pictures and you know the story, you know what we're talking about. But I fear that we tend to complicate the story. You can tell that same story in a completely other way um, in a way that people will never remember it. And I, I fear that this is kind of our tendency to tell the story in facts and data, and people just don't absorb it. Our stories need to be inspiring. They need to be interesting and vivid and memorable. And again, I can't go into all of these in detail, but we need to be truthful and authentic and emotional. We need to put things in, in black and white terms. They need to be morally compelling. We need to have good guys and bad guys um, we should use metaphors to reinforce our message, including recasting those of the opposition, which is exactly what that Wall Street Journal article did by taking our story and then twisting it a little bit and making it into theirs. And finally, we need to start from where our audience is, not where we wish it was. So that means, I'm sorry, in a lot of cases, it means dumbing it down. Um, speaking about this issue of heroes and villains, I just want to give you uh, an example um, it's not easy to, to cast renewables in the hero's role. And um, I thought a lot about that um, and had my own experience after Fukushima when big crisis. I thought to myself, how could we, is this a good opportunity for an experiment in how to cast renewables in the, in the hero's role? So I got in touch with um, Ueda-san from the Japan Wind Power uh, Association who told me that none of the wind farms, at least reported by any of their association members, had been affected by the earthquake or the tsunami, including a semi-offshore wind facility that was, what, 300 kilometers away from the epicenter of the earthquake. And it had survived not only the earthquake and the tsunami, it had come through with flying colors. Its new, its battle-proof, earthquake-resilient design had been exemplary. And in fact, the power companies had asked them to you know, power up as much as they could to compensate for the loss of electricity in the eastern parts of the country. So I did a Huffington Post um, piece about this. Now, I write for the Huffing Huffington Post all the time, and quite often, you know, you get 100 or 200 shares or likes. That's doing really well. Quite often, it's 15 or 20. That's sort of the normal. Well, if you look there, I got 8,300 likes, 2,500 shares, 1,100 tweets. I mean, that's about as viral as a renewable story is ever likely to go. And it just showed to me how hungry people really are for that kind of a story. It had all the, the drama of the good guy, you know, the little, the little engine that could, speaking of another childhood story, you know. People like that stuff. I think another good way to make uh, a story memorable, a uh, very tri good tried and true uh, method, is to pit rivals or, or take rivals who are normally pitted against each other and bring them together. So, for example, Coke and Pepsi, big rivals, competitors, sometimes you, you know, bring together total adversaries, and they come together at this one moment to support a cause or an action. And it's really powerful and appealing to people because it says that if something is so important that even these guys can set their differences aside, 
then it must be really important and it must be something I should pay attention to. So, but we can't all be Cokes and Pepsi. So again, if I could just give you a story from my own experience. Um, Greenpeace and the w WBCSD, they had been adversaries since the days of the original Rio conference in 92 when Greenpeace was campaigning around corporate greenwashing. And the, the BCSD, as it was called at the time, was kind of the champion of that in our view at that time. And so when it, 10 years later, when Johannesburg came around, um, and it, it, Remy Parmentier and, and uh, um, uh, Bjorn Stigson, the two guys on the right there, had been facing off at panels against each other for years uh, on opposite sides. Uh, we had a meeting in our office, and he said, you know, we really should be on the same side. We're all on the same side. You know, we agree that the Kyoto Protocol should be ratified. And it was our, it was our office in Amsterdam. I said, oh, really, are you willing to say that publicly? And he kind of hemmed and hawed and said, oh, I'll get back to you. Well, we ended up going ahead. There was a, um, a joint side event co-sponsored by the two in Johannesburg, which called for uh, a joint declaration on the need to bring the Kyoto Protocol into force. It was really explosive. Um, I think it almost got him fired. Uh, they had to alternate reading the sentences of this statement, and the offending words, we support the protocol ratification, came out of Remy's mouth instead of Bjorn's mouth, because it was really um, a big thing. And that room was packed. It was standing room only. It was the buzz of the conference. And I think it, it, it showed that you know if even these two rivals, who are normally um, adversaries, could just set their difference aside on this one night, it's really an important and powerful statement. And it really it worked. I think the other thing to remember about this communication strategy idea is that we need rapid reaction and repetition. Uh, I know you, you know, have a problem with resources, but really every time one of these myths gets repeated, it sort of roots its way deeper into the, the consciousness of the people who hear it. So we need to be fast and we need to be just pushing back really hard every time we hear it. And I know, you know, if you don't have the resources, you need to find a way to pull them or enlist others to do it for you. Somehow that has to be organized because we can't just keep letting these wrong things uh, persist. Um, I just want to say, you know, it sounds like I'm saying you should do this and you should do that. I actually honestly believe we are making a huge difference. We are making headway. As I say, we haven't quite got the new narrative rooted into our consciousness yet, the consciousness of the public, but we are making progress. You know, when, when Ban Ki-moon's statement, um, summary of what came out at the climate summit in September, he talked about a majority of, of countries in all regions at all levels of economic development, supporting a phase out of emissions in the second half of the century. I mean, that was a big deal. And the IPCC said we needed to phase out emissions by 2100. And even though we all know that's too late, the fact is the other side of that coin is that we need to phase in 100% renewables. And we're seeing campaigns to that effect cropping up all over the place. I know you guys had a whole session about it yesterday. but. Um, I remember just even a couple of years ago in the run-up to Rio Plus 20, we tried to actually tr see if we had critical mass to campaign on this, and we didn't. And it seems like now there probably would be critical mass to, to do a big push on 100% renewables. So just to say, I think we are doing something um, very right. And I just want to close on what I think the renewables sector can do uh, in the meantime. So first off, as I said, you know, I, I think the only thing I probably would agree with that horrible energy lobbyist, Richard Berman, was that this is a war and you need to budget for it and you need to get prepared. Uh, we need to, to fill that gap, the vacuum left behind is this uh, narrative around fossil fuels equals prosperity crumbles. It's going to crumble increasingly. Um, but I think that in the meantime, the most important thing that the renewable sector can do is to demonstrate that renewables are here, they're working, their market share is growing, they're effective, no one's shivering in the dark as a result of implementing um, renewables policies, and that this is happening in both developed and developing countries alike. I think it's important to remember that as, um, particularly for renewables companies, which have, you know, to financial or other kind of benefits to gain from advocating renewables, that's a less important message for you to put across. People would expect you to say that. But I think, so I think the most important thing that you need to be doing is providing the proof, because that helps validate those who are um, advocates. 
And I think we need to enlist a lot of different kinds of messengers. Messengers matter. So it's not just you guys talking about it. We need to have celebrities. We need to have people that you wouldn't normally expect to be on side to be communicating these issues. So as I said, I think the, um, that's the, the one. If I, if I could give you two takeaways to take home from this, it would be get organized and provide the proof. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kelly, for this um, great presentation and um, 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 communication strategy already as our mythologist. And thank you for putting me, as I am a journalist, in an um, identical crisis. For, yeah, so, uh, which, yeah, I, I'm not sure. We, we, we find out now which kind of type I belong. So thank you very much for, for the ones of you here in the audience in our live stream, global live stream, who haven't been here yesterday. Um, we're not alone here on the panel. Um, the panelists I will introduce to you in a, in a minute. We have um, two ladies who, who help us. One, one is Hannah. Where, where is she? Could you just stand up, Hannah? Say hello to the camera. This is Hannah uh, for our live stream global um, audience. Um, if you have questions, you can always ask, and Hannah will bring them to us on the panel so you can participate. And Kanika, where is she? There is Kanika, our uh, flying reporter, and she has the power of the microphone. Um, the ones who haven't been here yesterday, you will see. She will give you the word, but never the microphone. She will keep. Okay. So. Um, now let me introduce our um, other panelists. Um, it's Laura, Will Laura Williamson, the communication director of RAN21. Welcome <laughs> on your, <laughs> Laura. It's Hannah May, the communication director of Ergo. Uh, welcome, you just came from Berlin. And Christoph Bodewils, also director of communication from Agora. Welcome. So, um, thank you for being here, all of you talking about the, the, the myths. First of all, I would like to ask you, Kelly, I um, think or would, would I, what I learned about myth, the, the problem of a myth is that um, it always exists. So debunking the myth is like, uh, is like this Hercules cast. You will, you will never succeed because a myth, it doesn't matter whether, whether it's a lie or not, it will survive, as we know from the old myths from the, from the ancient times. What do you think? Is, is it possible to debunk a myth? Or do you have to like um, alternative and bigger myth, you know, like competitive myth? Son? Yeah, should be. I think that it doesn't happen. You, you can't see it in a one-on-one mm. -on -one situation mm. or in small groups. You can only look at it in a big picture. And I think, for example, we can look at the whole polarized, polarized debate around immigration mm. as another example of a clashing mythologies. And no, you're not going to convince people to change their deepest values and beliefs. I mean, anyone, for example, um, who you look at it again in the US at the Tea Party and if they tell you you should be opposed to gay marriage or abortion or whatever, how many people got convinced because somebody told them they should feel some way? So I don't think that's going to be what changes people's minds. But I do think that the more things become real, the more they become planted in people's minds as being, um, as working, and you, st you start taking away the fear factor. You start making people feel that this is a safe thing to do, that they're not going somehow against their whole culture. You, make it, you have to normalize it, and as you do that, I think the mythology starts to change. So I guess what I, what I tried to say in this presentation was you have to just look at the, the societal signals, the big issues and, and the trends. You're not going to, to look at it in terms of, you know, you're not going to fix this by changing one editorial mm. board at a time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hannah, you worked as a journalist for more than 10 years. Now you're on the other side. If it's right to say, we can discuss it, whether it is the other side, working as a consultant. Um, listening to, 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 to Kelly's keynote, what do you think? Is, like, um, is it like the, 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 the four types of journalists in which would you belong? Um, um, that, that this is a problem, that we, we don't um, get the message to the audience? Or would you say there are... Um, some problems or tasks to add? Hopefully I have belonged to group number four. Mm -hmm. So some people know me from my former um, um, area, working area as an editor for Renewable Energy magazine, so on and so far. I should belong to number you four. You should be the good um, one. <laughs> and, and, and I think what is important to add, uh, and I think the picture was absolutely right that you, that you um, made here concerning the, the, the journalists, but we have the same 
uh, grouping in, in the general public. And this is what we also have to discuss here. And this is basically what you um, asked me. And, and there was one sentence that, that you said, Kelly. You said, we think the public really understands it. And I guess this is one of the biggest misunderstandings because the, the big question is how relevant is this whole issue for most of the people? So I was, for example, pretty much surprised as I saw um, yesterday some figures from a, from a recent survey from BP Europe. They, they made a survey in five uh, European countries. And they asked uh, in, in Switzerland, in France, in Denmark, um, and I guess in the UK and Poland, uh, just normal people. Uh, have you ever heard something about Energiewende in Germany and what happened in this country after 2011? And, and I would ask you, what do you think, how many people in uh, Denmark and in France said yes? I would just say 50%, who was saying 50% knew what Energiewende is? So the, maybe, so I see you're, you're on the right track. Uh, in both countries, it was something about 15 or 16 percent of the, of, the, of the people who said, yes, we know what an Energiewende is. In Denmark and in France, the same level uh, of much more than 70 percent of people who said, we have no idea what an Energiewende is. So this is just very recent uh, survey which gives us an idea what we are talking about, so that, that a small group of uh, well-informed uh, and also, uh, how to say it, uh, positive-minded, which is something very important, uh, media representatives is working in this, in the, uh, on this issue and is addressing a very small group of specialists and, and, and the group in, in the general public is, uh, is even more diverse um, wh whom you want to address. So th this is what we are talking about, just to open the, how to say it, the field. Great. Christoph, I would like to ask you, since you have been a journalist as well, and now you work for an NGO, um, I sometimes wonder, talking about this storytelling, frameworking, which is very trendy at the moment, uh, every PR agency who comes to you speaks about that, that um, some of the PR agencies, of course not yours, you're, you're, you're the good one, um, uh, they um, talk about frameworking and storytelling, but they don't really care about the story. What is your experience? Well, um it's depending, I would say. Um, I would maybe, if I may uh, comment yes, on course. your thesis, uh, Hanne, I totally agree. And um, I also would like to do a little poll. Um, when it comes to Germany and you ask uh, the people, how do you like the Energiewende? Do you like it at all? Do you think it's the right thing? What do you think, um, how many people do agree with the Energiewende? More than 50%? More than 70? More than 80? It's, 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 it's about 90%. So literally everybody knows about the Energiewende in opposite to other countries like Denmark, which actually also has an even ambiti more ambitious Energiewende. Um, so I think it's depending on the state of the process in your country. In the very beginning, it's probably the very best you can do to... Um, tell stories to create narratives and so on. But in a, more major in a more major stage of the process, that could be dangerous. If you ask the same people, do you like the energie, you have asked, uh, do you like the energie vendor? If you ask them, do you think it's well managed? The answer is for 50% of the people, no, it's not well managed. And here it comes to the details and to the hard work. And that's not the story that's not the narr narrative, it's just doing your business and uh, doing it well, and uh, that means doing it well on, on the policy side, doing it well on the NGO side, and doing it well on the industry side. That's the same story with all things in the world. When they are becoming major more and more, they be are becoming complex, and we have to deal with them. And maybe that's the new story. So it's a complex thing, it's very complex, it will last for years to undergo this transition. Um, but 
the goal we can gain and the things we can achieve are worth all the work. And um, so the answer to your question is, do we need narratives? I would say yes, in the beginning we need them <coughs> really. And when the process of introduce, introducing a renewable energy matrix, we have to be very careful which narratives do we use and which one do we have to improve or even to cancel. Thank you very much, Christoph. Um, uh, I was already scared that Kelly has to open up a five-fifths category for people like me, journalists whose questions are not been answered. But, but you did, thank you. So um, I still have the chance to get into the good four, fourth group. Um, uh, Laura, what's, um, since you're the communication director for REN21, What's your experience as the director? How many journalists are interested in your story and your narrative? I just didn't see too many national, <coughs> international broadcasting and TV stations yesterday. Is it, is it, is it hard um, to get journalists interested in what REN21 is doing or it's vice, vice versa? It's really challenging. Mm. I mean, I think um, unlike the, the rest of the, the panelists up here, REN21 is a very small organization. We're a small secretariat. There's four mm. of us, permanent staff. We have people who come in to help. We have interns, but, and we wear multiple hats. Mm. So when it comes to communication and outreach, we really have to figure out who do we work with to amplify the message. We can never lead a campaign. We don't have the resources to um, sit and debate and write massive articles or sit on the phone and call journalists and, and really do a lot of what I would call legwork. So what we have to do, and it may be applicable for many of you in the room, is we have to find out who our allies are and use them to amplify the message. So for example, Oh, just one small example, we work a lot with GWEC, the Global Wind Energy Council. Because we have wind as part of you know, what, what we promote through REN21, but because they have a much bigger um, reach than we do. So we, if, we do a, if we do an article or we have something, we ensure that there's a wind component. I send it to um, Loha, their, their communications person. She'll often do a tweet or she'll include it in their newsletter. The hope is, is that wind uh, industry people will be reading it, but maybe then some of the opposition will be as well. Uh, you know, we try through our network to pr produce material that they can then use um, to outreach to their members. And I think the thing, sort of building somewhat on what Kelly was saying, is if you're a small organization, you cannot afford to be territorial. Mm. We're all on the right side. We're all on the same side of the equation. And while we may not have 100% agreement, large hydro, small hydro, do we do developing, industry, you know, whatever, we need to work together. And the, I think, at least from our perspective, the challenge we have as a small net, as a small secretary with a large network is identifying who we can amplify and how we do that amplification. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to raise a question, starting with Kelly, but of course, you all can participate and, 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 and answer. Talking about how to work with the media. Um, my personal point of view, the media is in a heavy transformation process. You mentioned the Huffington Post, which was or still is a pioneer of the new digital revolution, um, which really you know, um, um, uh, changes a lot inside the journalist world, uh, where we once ha have been the agenda setter, now we are more or less the agenda searcher and it makes, um, ha has a lot of possibilities. Um, so, I mean, probably, of course, you have to have a title, but the media, does it still exist, or is it one of the, th the things that you have to really know media and the different media um, um, varieties to work with? Uh, no, it, and I don't think it ever did exist mm, as yeah. a media. I think that it's, it's never been a one-size-fits-all thing and it's gotten even more complicated, um, especially when you have digital media, new media. And, you know, I, I think I'm really active on social media because I'm on Twitter. I've got like 7,500 followers, so well, big me. But, you yeah. know, but there's all, I'm not, there's Pinterest, there's mm. Tumblr, mm. there's Instagram, there's Reddit, there, you know, there are just so Facebook many. Facebook is already like in a dinosaur. Well, Facebook <laughs> I use for just for personal stuff. Right. So, I mean, yeah. so, yeah. you know, and, that, yeah. and that's where people are, where those conversations are happening. But I think that for communication strategy, you have to be strategic about it. We can't match them dollar for dollar by a long shot. So we have to get organized, we have to work together, but we have to pick 
we have to find where the Achilles heels are in the system. Where is, like, who's that one person or publication or group of whatever, that if we change that, it cascades on elsewhere? You know, where, if you, if you just take this one argument out, the rest fall apart. And I think that's the real art of designing communication strategies is finding that um, Achilles heel. And I know it's not easy. I mean, I, you know, talk back about, you know, the Johannesburg time. We were trying to figure out I mean, renewables, energy, I think ending energy poverty, we called it choose positive energy, was the main theme for our campaign that year. And I'll never forget one of our, our comms people saying, you know, the problem with communicating about renewables is that they're worthy but dull. And that's always stuck with me because that's exactly right. So how do you make them exciting, not just worthy but exciting? And it's not easy. But again, I think that, that Fukushima one where you had the nuclear, nuclear power really cast in the villain's role, you have opportunities. And there's going to be more oil spills and, you know, as climate change, you know, with climate change, renewables are immediately cast in the hero's role. So we just need to be more creative about how we communicate that. And one final point I wanted to make about you know, this question of we think the public is aware of it. Do you realize that in, in, after Copenhagen, I mean, I thought there was such massive media in the run-up to Copenhagen, it didn't even make the top 10 stories of the year. You know, Michael Jackson's funeral was a lot, you know, that was probably one of the main stories of the year. More people heard about that than they heard about Copenhagen. So, and that was, everybody was communicating on that. So, you know, again, we, we just have to find... Michael Jackson's... We can get Michael Jackson tweeting about it. That would be really good. We'd really get a lot of coverage for that. Just, yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. Rainer wants to, you know, <laughs> raise his hand, the, the next Michael Jackson <laughs> of the renewables. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we can, yeah. <laughs> Kelly can work on your hero story. Um, so, um, I just, just want, just want yeah, to, to reply to this yeah. because I think what you ju just uh, said at the end is something very important. That we always have to make ourselves, put ourselves in mind how relevant is the issue we are talking about. How much is it really on the top list of normal people, of everybody. So, and, and if you're so much in something like in, in this renewable movement, and I've been working for, for these industries for many years, I, I guess I know this very much, how, how much you do this by heart and how much it means to you and how much you want to have successes. So, and that means that, that you, you tend to have the perception that everybody else around should feel the same thing and should be also that active and understand what, what you want and what the truth is. So, but what is the truth? This is nearly a philosophical question. So, and this leads to to wrong expectations. So, and this uh, also brings me back to your question to Christoph, that you said, ah, these, well, these PR agents and consultants, they just sell a story and they don't care about the story. Sorry, this is the job of a PR consultant. Yeah? He's paid for it to sell every story. So I just say this, this is just what, what PR is doing. Yeah, to look at it, let it, let us say, with a with a invent, with, but, a, but, 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 with but, a cool but let me ask you with a cool head and say, okay, how can I, how yeah, can I sell this? And and this what kind of it story? doesn't just mean. Let me hmm? ask: Is it like to invent a story or to find a story, which makes a difference? As well as as well yeah, as this okay. Is, it is also, in a way, this uh, really technical thing, yeah, to create stories and to 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 find the, the the right messages and to place them. So this is what what the whole industry is doing, and and, and most of the people who are running around there. So I might be different because I have a different history, yeah. Uh, don't do it by heart. They just see this is an interesting issue, like a, like a manager of a big uh, co company. Yeah? He, he's professional in managing a company, and on the other hand, you have the PR people who are professional in doing this business. So if they also are interested and they think, ah, this is really nice and I, and, and I like to work for it, then it's perfect, then it's a perfect match, but it's not necessary in general. Okay, maybe... Um, oh. 
may, um, may I provoke all of you, but then we have questions from the audience and we have live stream questions, so just one more round and then we have from, from our live stream we have questions and um, you are allowed to ask. Kandika is going around. Just one more question, because um, if, if this is right, that you have to just find a story, and if it's right what you all say about, you know, um, the, the, the perception of renewables, that in a lot of countries people just don't know uh, whether it's good, or as you said, in, in, it was England, wasn't it, the example that there is a majority um, um, for renewables, but a minority knows that there is a majority. So the PR RNC, that's a provoking question, don't go do a good job, do they? If the story is like, you know, or, or let me say it in the, in the, in the first sentence of the Clue Train Manifesto, which was so, like the, the, the internet thing, was the first sentence, markets are always conversations. Do you think you're in a good con conversation, talking about the renewables already, or do, do you have to work on the conversation to the people? If so, 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 so many people don't know about the good renewables. We can't forget, though, what the other side is doing. I mean, there's a reason those people don't know that and that they are misled. I mean, you know, we've got a whole skeptical media um, presence in the UK that, you know, there are people actively working to make sure the people are still confused about it. So I think we can't, we're never going to out-argue them. We're never going to get our message across by simply putting forward the correct information. I think we have to be dynamic, we have, to be, we have to be prepared to fight. And this is, again, why I talk about approaching it as a campaign or, and, and talking about a culture war. I mean, you have to be controversial. You have to be prepared to stick your neck out and say something that somebody might bite your head off. You have to be prepared to defend it and to be able to argue it. I totally agree with you. It's not helpful to be doing it on the basis of people who don't know what they're talking about, but you have to actually approach it um, with the understanding that the other side is actually undoing all the good work you're doing. What do they have, uh, what, what you're missing, is it money, or, or influence, what do you think, the other side? Of course they have money, they can, you know, buy ads, they can buy all, you know, the, the, the team of lobbyists who spend all of their time doing this and only this, of course they have that. But what we've got is the, you know, a lot of public volunteers, people, there are a lot of people who care. We've got youth groups who are keen. You know, I once um, had this idea, and again, we hadn't, didn't have the capacity with the, the GCCA, the Tick, Tick, Tick campaign I was running to do this, but I thought we needed a comments army. Let's enlist all of the young people to just sit and monitor the comments pages of these blogs and fight back, because that's where a lot of this bad discourse is happening. And, you know, occupy the sites and mm -hmm. fight back and set them straight and constantly just stop letting it take root like that. And I, these people are keen to help. Somebody just needs to organize it. Mm -hmm. Christoph, and then we go to the audience. What do you I, think? I, I totally agree. But to do this, you have to do also your homework. You have to prove that you are better or that you can deal with problems or issues which will occur. And um, that's why I would say that you have to add facts to the stories, to the narratives, and you have to... Um, prepare the facts, you have to do research, you have uh, maybe to conduct studies, and to, to, you have, you, you need ways to provide those information to the public. I mean, uh, I'm with Agora Energiewende, um, so my job is basically um, to communicate results from our studies to the public, for instance, why renewable energy is way cheaper than everybody thought or that uh, the lights uh, won't uh, come dark with uh, renewable energy in Germany also, and, and so on. And uh, that's, that's my message, by, but I always can answer the question after this message and that's the homework everybody has to do the more renewable energy comes into the system. Thank you very much. Laura wants to add? Yeah, just, just a quick comment. I mean, and I suppose it's to the panelists, but it's also to people on the floor. You know, it's great. You can do PR, you can do campaigns, but, you know, REN21, we can't do that. There are people in the room, that's not what they're working on. They're working on data collection, really, you know, providing the argumentation. So it would be interesting to hear maybe through the course, you know, th either through here or from people on the floor is, what is it that, small, you know, 
organizations that are helping to promote and document the role of renewables. How do we contribute? How can we best contribute to those of you who are at that higher level, who have the ability to do the outreach, who have the communication skills, who have the PR connections? Because I would argue that probably in this room, at least half of the people here, we can't even begin, don't have the resources, don't have the mandate to even enter into this process, but we need to. So, you know, how do we, how do we bring those, those, those components together? I don't have the answer. Yeah. I'm asking you a yeah. question. <laughs> Very good question. Um, and maybe we can just add some more questions from, from the audience and start with, with Hannah. We collect some questions, not, not too many, but, but Hannah first. Uh, what's, what's the question from the live stream? Oh, ah, you need a microphone. Okay, can I click on? Uh, actually, I can read it out right now. It's from an anonymous source, and uh, basically what it says is, to what degree do you think, uh, it's a question for the whole audience, that it's productive to also piggyback on bigger topics like climate change in general, that has a much bigger kind of public visibility, and is this uh, a channel that the renewable energy sphere should also follow, or is it counterproductive? Okay, thank you very much. Now, Kanika, I've, I've, I've seen a lot of hands, but three or four we can collect, and then, yeah, is that okay for you? Great. So, don't okay. take her okay, microphone. Okay, okay. You know she's so, the boss. So, um, uh, I want to make uh, two points, and um, the first one is that uh, we need to get the right message, and um, I'm very thankful for the quote uh, by Stefan Singer yesterday from Mahatma Gandhi, first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, at least in Germany, they are already fighting us, the renewable energy sector. And the main argument is that um, even the oil companies start to say, yes, uh, we, we need to save the climate, but energy needs to be affordable. So the cost argument um, is one of the most important. And um, that's my, my second point. We need to get numbers right. And um, yesterday, I have scanned uh, through this report from REN21, and then I saw um, the figure nine uh, with the levelized cost of electricity. Here you state um, solar energy costs between just below 10 cents to up to 85 cents per kilowatt hour. And uh, to be honest, um, this is very uh, contraproductive because it's not a reality. In 2014, we don't have uh, that high levelized cost of electricity and here, um, in the end, you state these are numbers from studies before 2009. Um, yesterday, uh, we had this quiz that um, solar uh, photovoltaics cost, um, think, about 61% um, in just one year. And um, here are numbers presented that are eight years old, or I don't know. So um, if you tell a story um, to, to the media, and um, you say, okay, we need to save, save the climate. Everybody says, yes, that's great. I want to save the climate. And if you then say, but it costs you 10 times as much as fossil energy, that's not a sexy story. And, and we, need, we don't need to talk about um, writing the story bef before we don't have the right number. And um, just recently, um, we at Fraunhofer Easy conducted a study or still working on this with, uh, together with Agora Energiewende. And um, we looked at the long-term cost perspective for photovoltaics, and what we see is that um, photovoltaic and wind energy will be the cheapest energy sources by 2050, costing just three or four cents per kilowatt hour even in Germany, and we don't have that much sun and wind. So I think that's the most important message to concentrate on the opportunity and what you can save, and not um, on the restrictions. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Um, I see already you're um, a happy competitor for the quiz this afternoon. So watch this guy. He knows a lot of data. I just know the sentence, never believe in the data you didn't fake yourself. <laughs> but we uh, watch, <laughs> look for, 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 for I'm, different I'm Mustafa, remarks. I'm working at uh, Mina Renewables and Sustainability based in Casablanca. Um, my question, at, at least from a Moroccan, African perspective, mm -hmm. and let's say context, we see uh, Germany um, uh, many lesson, uh, uh, learned lessons from Germany, and I wanted to ask what are the key uh, secrets for the successful story in Germany to have these 90% of German public, let's say, uh, agree with the energy fund, but also I, I see that Germany succeeded to install, uh, let's say, 
uh, many uh, 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 huge capacity uh, in wind and solar. So I want also uh, to know what are, uh, let's say, the key message that the German government gave to the public in order to have their support, uh, of course, for the cost and for the effort to uh, change, let's say, the energy uh, structure, energy supply structure and energy systems. Okay, thank you very much. We take one more question and then we make a second round, but you know, just to um, let all the honest answers be properly. So one more and then there will be a second round and in 10 minutes time, the holiday starts. So be prepared to say Kölle Alaaf, but now Kanika with the next question or remark. <laughs> I won't <laughs> steal the try. microphone. So. <laughs> the, um, the cost thing is a, is a moving target and it depends on where you uh, look because it's all nice to say that it'll be the cheaper than anything else in Germany in 2050. Well, it already is cheaper than everything else in South Africa. It already is cheaper than everything else in Australia and in Brazil and in Mexico. Wind energy and solar either already there or catching up quickly. But that doesn't really matter because you end up having the debate wherever you are. So global cost data, I find everybody tries to collect it and I've never seen one that you couldn't argue with. So. Um, that's just a problem we have to deal with on a country by country basis. But what I wanted to say is that in terms of the, the, the war and peace aspect of this thing, um, we're all very nice people. We're all very pretty people. We always speak nicely. We don't denigrate others. We don't um, play dirty. Um, so are we then condemned to lose? We'll look good. We can lose with style and flair. Um, or are we prepared to get ugly and take the, the fight to the fossil fuel industry, um, which I have been fighting personally for about 40 years and will continue to do so, yeah. but, um, and will have used the same line for 40 years, that the fossil fuel industry is the most powerful economic interest in the world today. It is the most powerful vested interest in the world today and quite probably in human history. And their agenda is to maintain the status quo. And if we think we're going to beat them by being nice or being right, I think we're wrong. So at some point, we're going to have to, I mean, it's all very well to sit here in Germany where for other reasons you've won. And I think that the, the mythology or the culture or whatever that's built up here um, is, if not unique, very, very special for a number of reasons in that the anti-nuclear movement ended up taking over the government at one stage. That's a gross oversimplification, but in a, in a, to a very large extent, that's what happened. And that's where the EEG came from. And that's where the locally owned renewable energy came from, which provides the great popular support. And it costs more money to do it that way. And everywhere else where we're trying to do it on the cheap, we're leaving all the local individual owners out of it. And when we're trying to do it on the cheap, are we cutting off all our best allies by doing so? But I think in the rest of the world, if you read the Anglo-Saxon press, the energy vendor is, a, is an expensive boondoggle failure, which ha doesn't have the support of the German people. If you read the Murdoch press, whether it be the Wall Street Journal or the Telegraph or the publications in most of the mainstream publications in the United States and Australia, the energy vendor has no public support, uh, is uh, a colossal economic failure, and Germany is in danger of uh, having the lights go out at any second and having to rely, their story goes, on nuclear power from France. When the reality we know is that Germany has been supplying the electricity deficit in France for the last three or four years, and will probably continue to do so. But it doesn't matter. Um, but until we're willing to fight back on that level, I think we have a, a very, very, uh, we'll look good, and we'll have nice little publications, but we're gonna lose. Okay, thank you very much uh, for this, um Statement for more ugliness. We, um, but, but, but let me say personally, if you fight for 40 years already, it seems to be possible to fight ugly but stay um, pr pretty because you don't look that ugly uh, for, 40, for 40 years of fight. Yeah, so I think yeah, you're the best proof that you're not right. <laughs> but okay. Um, so now, because, pardon me, 
uh, Michael Jackson, what was Why your point? Yeah, 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 that's <laughs> right. Okay, <laughs> okay. Uh, Michael agrees uh, with me. So um, I know there are a lot of more questions. You all get the possibility, uh, hopefully all of you, um, to raise your question or make your remark. But um, since we have four panelists and it's not too easy to, to remember everything, I would say we start right now with answering the first questions in the first round and then um, it's your turn again. Uh, ugly or pretty, we will see. Uh, who wants to start? Maybe Laura. Uh, Hannah? Uh, she already has yeah. the power and the Sorry, microphone. Sorry, I just grabbed the no, microphone. No, no, that's great. That's <laughs> I, ju I just wanted to come back to some of the, the aspects. So there, there was this discussion about costs and how to communicate um, the, the, how, how much renewable energy costs and, and this levelized cost of electricity, as you know for sure, is a, is a good parameter, but also could be a misleading parameter. I just wanted to remind you what we have seen, and this was also raised by some of the public here in the, the whole grid parity debate in photovoltaics. That you can say that the first start to go into this road was in a way a dead end. Yeah? Because as the this whole grid parity issue was raised some years ago, it, it looked like if we achieve grid parity in a market, then everything will be fine. Um, and this is just what, what also was, was said now. It, it didn't turn up to be like this. So, so this kind of story was absolutely misleading. Uh, and I see a lot of people nodding, so because they all made this experience. And this shows how tricky it is to, to create a story about costs. Yeah? And this is just what Christoph also said. The reality is much more complex, as you all know. And, and if you want to tell a simple story, you have to really be sure that the simple uh, story is true in the end. So um, this is what we have learned from okay. the whole grid parity issue. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I also wanted to say one, re one remark to, to um, Steve's um, statement, do we need to play dirty? Mm. I would say um, yes. Uh, and to, to some extent, we also see it. I guess the, the people who play like this, they don't see that they are playing dirty, but in a way they do it. If I talk to, to German politicians, for example, members of the parliament, and I ask them, what was uh, remarkable for you in the last one or two years? Which group was really active uh, doing lobbying in, in the German parliament? They all, the first things really, many uh, parliament members say is renewable energy business. And you're a bit like, whoop, why this? Is it? Oh, there was so much pressure from, from renewable energy business on our, on our, on our politicians uh, during the amendment of the EEG. It was really annoying and I, it was getting on my nerves and there were so many letters and so many people coming to me. So in a way, that's, that's what I see. There is still um, a lot of pressure, and there is power from the industry, at least in some, some markets. Um, and the results are not often, um, uh, how to say it, um, accepted in a way that, that you might like. So, and, and that means there is, a, there is something going on. Um, you, you might not say this is dirty play, but to what the people who are playing it. What do you mean with, 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 with fighting ugly? Um, like just fighting ugly means means more uh, not telling the truth, for example, or manipulating in a way that that is really ugly. Yeah, if you're really so manipulating the truth. This is not. This is not. I would not say that this is what you should do. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but to, because but this now is I'm all, interested. I, I'm I'm I'm, I'm, <laughs> all, I'm really agreeing with what yeah. Kelly said. No, you only, always have to be one truthful. Yeah, yeah. Only okay. one minute. Okay. Um, you have to be more intelligent. This is what, what yeah, Laura that's also said. An answer to, that to, means, to my question, yes, you know. of course. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't have the, the silver bullet for you okay. now. Yeah? Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. But you have to say, my resources are like this, mm -hmm. and I want to, to achieve this goal. And how much uh, time should I consume from the mm -hmm. people I would like to, to, to address? This is what I say. And, and, and in this uh, extent, some of the representatives of the industry have overdone it, yeah? because they have 
put too much pressure on politicians or on whomever. This was not good. This was too mm -hmm. too ugly in a way. Yeah, mm -hmm. but but anyway, this is the way you should do it, but with more uh, how to say it. Um, ugly but clever. Right, m more clever. Yeah, uh, ugly like so. but clever. <laughs> ugly but clever. That's a yeah. good point uh, because now Christine is going to be on uh, Funke Mariechen. Yeah, now is it 11 11? Ah, 11 11. So um, as I said, so that's a religious holiday for all of us. So I say three times, color and you know what to say. So uh, for all of us uh, around the world, this is, um, this is Bonn, the Rhineland, and this is the starting of the Carnival Campaign for Renewables Energy 2014. Kölle. Allah. Kölle. Allah. Kölle. Allah. Wonderful. <laughs> all my Cologne friends will love you anyway. Great. So this is the start of a campaign. Isn't it a good story? <laughs> what do you think? Now I have to get red nose, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're from Ry uh, sort of, uh, North Rhine-Westphalia. You're from Westphalia, which yes, is... I, yeah? I, I try yeah? to adopt. Yeah, okay, um, great. <laughs> um, well, um, I, I would like to comment on the question uh, from the gentleman uh, from Morocco. What's the key success um, we had in Germany? And uh, I think it's uh, conjuncted with the fact you mentioned. Um, the legislation in Germany made it possible that uh, very much, a, a lot of people could participate in the Energiewende just by building their own PV power plants on their roofs or uh, in becoming a shareholder in a cooperative and so on. And after all, we have more than one million people engaged in renewable energy in Germany. So that's really a political force. And uh, after all, no one of the political parties in the Bundestag right now is against renewable energy because there, there <laughs> you can look where you want. Uh, you have shareholders in renewable energy in all parts of the political spectrum. So that's probably one part of the story. Um, and the other one is that the legislation of the EEG is, um, was, was designed to uh, make renewables cheaper, 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 and cheaper. And that addresses, of course, the cost questions. And when now in some media is mentioned that the energy vendor comes at a high price, this is very true. That's the price of the past. But now renewable energy is very cheap. And uh, I think in uh, some some parts, uh, or not in some parts, uh, in, in, in Germany today, a uh, combined wind and PV system comes at a lower price than uh, power from, for instance, a new gas-powered uh, plant or uh, maybe even a new hot coal-powered plant. So it's really competitive. And that's also the reason why all over the world uh, new solar and wind farms uh, are popping up. So. Um, power companies see that there is a business case for them. And uh, that was made possible by the EEG, not only in Germany, but maybe, for instance, in, in, in Denmark or maybe also in Spain. Um, and we have to pay that now. We have to pay for this kind of rucksack. But uh, other people in the world, they don't, have, they don't have to pay. You don't have to pay. For instance, France could install the same amount of solar power today for only 30% of the price. Germany had to pay for that. And uh, that's very cheap. Thank you, Christoph. We still have the uh, question of the anonymous live stream um, fan, yeah. <laughs> Laura. Could you um, try to? Yeah, if, if, I, if I heard the question correctly, mm. it was about whether or not it's wise or um, to piggyback on larger issues. Um, you know, as somebody says, there's no silver bullet. I would argue yes, but I think you have to go in with your eyes wide open. If you're going to piggyback on larger issues, you have to really understand the issue you're piggybacking on, understand what um, you might be targeted for that may be outside of your sphere, your knowledge sphere. Uh, but sometimes the bigger issues have that emotional message that Kelly was talking about. I mean, we've talked about it in the office. Renewables, are they really sexy? Well, we think they are. That's why we're in the field. But yeah, yeah it's technology 
technology. It's, mm. you know, people want power, but they maybe don't really want to know. They want to get from A to B. They want to be able to turn on the lights. They want to be warm. They want to be cool. But they maybe not, don't really care where it's coming from. But if you can tap into that emotional argument, which sometimes the larger issues bring, then it can really drive your argumentation and really support what you're trying to promote. The flip side is, is that an emotional argument is emotional. So you have, you increase the risk that you will get uh, a negative um, backlash. And so you have to be smart about what you're using and how you frame it. But I would argue that it can really lead to some, some really productive outcomes. Great. There are a lot of questions. I directly come to you. Just one more um, remark from, from, from Kelly. Yeah. That point. I just want to say that um, when we talk about fighting, remember that the other side's narrative is crumbling. They may be winning because they have the money or whatever, but they are losing, in fact. So they are cast in the role of the bad guys, the villains. Our narrative casts us in the role of the good guys. So just remember that by fighting, doesn't mean fighting dirty. It means, you know, I mean, think about who all of our heroes are. You think about David and Goliath. I mean, you know, David shot this slingshot. He wasn't being nice, he, but he was being honorable. Harry Potter uh, in Game of Thrones, Ned Stark, he chopped the guy's head off in the first show. You know, I mean, every hero that we look at in our culture, they fight. They're not nice necessarily, but they don't, but they're honorable in some way. So I think it's important to remember that. With regard to accuracy, of course we need to be accurate. The experts need to be accurate. But that doesn't mean the public has to be. You're not, you can't expect the public who are having these dialogues around the kitchen table to have all the facts and figures at hand. You need to equip them with the stories that they will remember. They're not going to remember the price per kilowatt hour or the blah, 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 parody, blah, blah, blah. You know, they're going to remember that we need renewables because it's the solution to climate change or I want clean water and blah, blah, blah. So that's the level on which that conversation is going to be happening. So what we need to do is empower you know, those people to be the heroes in this story. They are the crusaders for renewables. Give them what they need to do it, and then let it go. Let it take on its own life. Thank you very much. Oh, no, I have a microphone. You can keep, 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 keep <laughs> the power, the power. To, to, to talk. Yeah, But yeah, keep the power. And now the power is up to you. Some more remarks. I know there are a lot, and we try to Get, oh my God, yeah, we try to get as much as possible. Uh, all right, we, we start over there, can, can you come? Okay, thank you. Yeah. Ulrike Rados from Austrian Energy Agency. We are a scientific organization. Um, my, my comment is we all are trying to install and implement renewables, and I think uh, there's only very few people who would contradict these efforts. Uh, but we have to stick to the possibilities we do have, and thanks. To Stephen, who mentioned that we have uh, a great power in the utilities who, who are the, as he said, they represent one of the most, po most powerful industries in the world. Um, I think we, we have to agree on that, and this is the, the enemy or the, the other position we have to fight. What I think we have to use the possibilities we have and I think the young gentleman, he was right, we have to put our, our position on stable grounds, and these are also figures like prices and costs, and, we, and the renewables, they have to be affordable. We, also, we always have to answer the question, who is going to pay for it and how are we going to pay for it. And the possibilities we have, we have campaigning, this was mentioned in the, in, the, in the plenary session, we have campaigning and we have lobbying. What we do most of the time, we do awareness raising, this is very uh, a cumbersome work, but this is the possibility we have. And we also can use, make use of legislation, which is done in Austria now. We do have the new energy efficiency law, which is which has the same name, EEG, as in, in Germany, the renewable energy law. But this, how it can be done, and we have to continue our efforts. Yeah. Thank, you Thank you very much, Ulrike. And it's a good idea if um, all of you just introduce yourself just shortly with, with your name and organization that all the panelists know about you. So uh, David was next, right? Thank you, uh, the panelists. Um, my, my concern is... Um, the 
the, the overseas development assistance in terms of promoting renewable energy in developing countries, particularly uh, sub-Saharan Africa, has really um, been over undermined for uh, many, many years. And I don't know how the media can help shape this so that there is green procurement, so that there is uh, promotion of renewable energy beyond solar lighting, beyond uh, uh, cooking stoves, to more kind of uh, 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 livelihood support and applications. Because um, all, almost all the diplomatic embassies and, and, co and, and development assistance has not factored in uh, uh, the renewable energy aspect. In, in all ways, there is a, a lot of use of diesel generators. If you went to American embassy, you find over 200 generators. The British High Commission generators. So no hybrid system, no application of solars. And I think this is the entry point towards building the market uh, confidence that, uh, uh, as Kelly says, you have to demonstrate that it works. And this is certainly the entry point. So how can you, as the media, really help uh, shape this trend in the development cooperation. Thank you. you. Just, thank you very much. Just tell your organization and where you're from, just to all of us. Uh, uh, my name is David Debong. I'm a project developer from Clean Energy Partnership Africa in Uganda. Thank you. Thank you, David. So we take two more questions, and this lady will kill me if we don't because she, yeah. All okay. right. So please, uh, I don't want to die. Um, Today on the on the on the holiday, yeah. you won't die. <laughs> only together, only together with Michael Jackson, I will die. For for for, for, for renewables, of course. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. The killing lady is called Alexandra Samse, represents the European Commission, and the European Commission doesn't kill anyone. Believe me. Uh, we'll one talk remark about that later, and Alexandra. one question. Remark on piggybacking. Uh, I very much agree with Laura that we need to piggyback and. To us, the biggest issue on which we can piggyback is actually energy security. Because from big geopolitical issue, you can actually go down into very local solution like energy cooperative. I mean, what do you do for the people? How you can become self-sustainable? And this is uh, uh, something uh, we actually we are building up and we are using as an excuse to uh, push for more uh, renewable. Then my question, and this relates to what Steve just said uh, as regards this opposition between the big utilities, Veolia, IDF, uh, Aeon, and the renewable community. I have indeed the feeling that we, renewable community, we are always very nice. Um, and um, I don't want us to play dirty, but I would like us to play smart. And in terms of communication, I am looking for good stories. Business do have good story. If you look at Aku Energy, if you look at other things, they are really self-speaking story. But where are the media? Where is a movie about renewable energy? I'm not talking about climate change. There are lots of. But I cannot find a, a movie to, for a wide audience, not a technological oriented, but a movie for normal citizens about renewable. Where are the stars? I mean, apart from the French actress Melanie Laurent, I've never seen anyone standing up for renewables, so I'm asking where are they? Because I, working for the European Commission, I mm -hmm. deeply need them. And the last point is that so far, the best communication exercise that I've seen is from 121. And I mean, I'm just not saying that to polish you guys, but I mean, clearly, when I mean, your reports, your figures are super helpful, and I use them all the time because they are, they are I mean, better self speaking than the ones from the IA, although. The one from the IA are excellent from data perspective, but for reaching a wide audience, this is the best exercise I've seen so far. Thank you. Thank you, Alexander, for not killing me and for the very interesting point. Um, I will get to you late, later about that, uh, about the movie thing. Uh, Rainer. Well, Michael Jackson, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm Rainer from the Re German Renewable Energy Federation and from the European Renewable Energy Federation. Mm -hmm. uh, what I was going to say, indeed, uh, I think we don't have to play dirty because dirty would mean uh, we use the weapons and uh, the reasons of the of the other side but what we have to do is to play clear and uh, not so scrupulous uh, i think 
One of our major problems, of course, I have only a minute or two, and so I have to be quite focused. One of our major problems is that we know too much and we dare not say that there are no interim solutions. So I have seldom seen people trying to communicate on our side who say renewables will be the strongest energies uh, in 2040. It could be if the right policy decisions are taken and the price will be between five and 500. So uh, we, know too, we know too much and uh, sometimes we mix up being, being the experts, which we definitely know. So you're right, we have to get the figures right. But when we communicate them, let's decide which of these 500 correct figures uh, we communicate. So not playing dirty, but playing with very simple uh, easy messages, uh, and maybe even stronger, they must be so easy that they fit on the headlines uh, on these crazy papers like Bild Zeitung in Germany and The Sun in the UK. Three word messages, so renewables will win, mm -hmm. or renewables are winning, full stop. Not if, 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 mm -hmm. if, they will. This is my Thank message. you very much, Rainer. Um, Okay, yeah, one, but one, I one. think well, uh, Ernesto Macias Alliance, but I'm talking about my experience in many years in communication in, in Spain, for, uh, concretely. I think we talk a lot in general, but I think uh, regarding communication to whom we want to communicate, what, we, what, what do we want to get, in which country, who is uh, establishing this communication, for which purpose, which are the targets? I mean, it's very complex. Obviously, if we have the right messages, we communicate the right messages to whom? In which media? For what? No care. Nobody cares about that. The thing is, it's clear, it's very simple in the, for example, European Commission. You can have access to the people who decide. So communication is very simple. You make the right papers and go straight to the people who decide. In Spain, well, one example that uh, happened uh, in 2004, I think, or five. We did, we, the, 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 the PB market, the PB association gave wrong figures to get higher uh, uh, tariffs. So the disaster came afterwards. So it was a dirty communication, that, but wrong communication. And at that time we have the direct line with the politician. How, now how we, whom we want to convince about what. So, we need to go part by part. I mean, it, there, is not, there is not the same message in Spain. We know we are absolutely competitive, but who cares? We have overcapacity in the system. Nobody wants more additional capacity in the system. It's very expensive. It's the same in Uganda or it's the same in South Africa. Messages and targets are absolutely different. We cannot speak in general. In general, it doesn't work. Thank you very much. So I think... Um, no, 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 no. Sorry, we, no, Kanika. Sorry, it's really we we, we get to to next round. Yeah, we still have some time, and you know, um, but let us answer this first, and then in the next round, the next questions. It's good to have the inter interactivity, but give the panelists the chance to answer. It's already a lot. Let me just summarize what what I found out with really interesting remarks from Alexandra Reiner, everybody about this war and peace thing. Um, is this, and we start with, with Laura, is it really about fighting ugly or is it like, you know, not more like you, you have to be more sexy yeah? and, and believe, but if, if you don't believe uh, that you're sexy, nobody else will do. Laura, what do you think? I mean, of course, personally, the most sexiest panelists alive, yeah. but talking about the re <laughs> renewable energy. Yeah? Is maybe uh, that a problem that the scene or the community doesn't believe, as Rainer puts it, instead of if, 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 um, will, will, will <laughs> sentences that you have to talk with yourself? What do you think? I don't know. I mean, we, okay. we battle with this in REN21, you know, because we, we're a data, you know, we data collection, we pull lots of information in from various sources, we cross-reference, you know, we, we, we really want to communicate the message, but we also want to have the numbers behind it so that people, other people can then use it. Um, what I actually was, was, was more drawn to was, was Ernesto's comment that we have to know who we're communicating. It's not easy. It's like house cleaning. 
okay? This is not an easy task. It's tedious. It's repetitive. You've got to talk, talk, talk. You've got to constantly think about what you need to change, how you need to change it. And you also have to habit yourself, habituate yourself to doing certain things. I mean, there's, the, there's a running joke in the office. I am probably the most technolo technologically challenged person around, right? I don't tweet. I have a really old phone. Look, it sends smoke signals. You know, it's not even a <laughs> smartphone. But, but the battery probably is longer but the, than the battery other. life is great. So from an environmental <laughs> perspective, I'm all set. Yeah, great. Um, yeah. But <laughs> what I've had yeah. to learn is how to use some of this media. I don't necessarily use it myself. Thank God we have an intern that helps me. But I've had to, I've had to discipline myself to say, every time we do something, I have to do A, B, C, and D. Then I have to go back and I have to check. Did A work? Yes or no. Did B work? Yes or no. Okay, we've got to rethink that. It's really time consuming. And I think part of the frustration we have is we have this great story we want to tell. We have all these various components. We don't have enough time. And I guess the message for me uh, when I was thinking about this panel is we have to be realistic about what we have. And if we all do it together, and if we all take a component of it, we will succeed and we will be smart smart, and we will help the argumentation crumble, but we have to be realistic. And if you try to do everything, it's not going to work. You know, it's just like in your job, you know, thank God I'm not the technology person or we'd still be writing on a chalkboard, okay? So I, th I think what we, you know, and it, and it comes to what is, what is the message we want to deliver, how do we want to deliver it, and how can we best do it? What is my strength? What is the strength of the Vargas group? What is the strength of your group, you know? Um, and we need to form those alliances. Thank you very much. Kelly. Just a couple of things. First off, um, I just want to say very clearly, in my experience, if you're never saying anything controversial, you're never going to have an impact. So when we talk about not playing nice, I, again, I don't think we need to be um, dishonest or in any way underhanded or dirty, but we have to be prepared to be controversial and exactly as you said, come out and make blanket statements and let them challenge it because when people challenge it, you foster that kind of dialogue that I was saying, that's how these things stick in people's minds when they talk about it, when they challenge. Secondly, um, in terms of piggybacking, I think that the best thing you can do, is, as I mentioned earlier, um, there are so many complicating factors now to the old paradigm, the old narrative. We've got land issues, water issues. So for in the, in the United States, for example, massive community opposition to both fracking and the Keystone pipeline, both of which have spawned really powerful coalitions that are in favor of renewables. And I, there are at least two celebrities that I know of that are really on the front lines of this. Mark Ruffalo, in terms of fracking, who's now started a project called the Solutions Project, which is advocating for 100% renewables. Daryl Hannah, who's really been active on the Keystone Pipeline. I mean, she actually lives off the grid in her house in Malibu. It's all renewable run. She goes on Fox News and debates, you know, Sean Hannity and Glenn Beck and those guys, I forget who exactly, but she goes on and debates in favor of renewables. So if you piggyback onto these local battles, and those are two American examples, every community, every country has their own local battles for which renewables are the solution. So strongly suggest that you piggyback onto those. Thank you very much. Hanne, you always want to give me the microphone. That's no, nice. That. Oh, you're, there. You're, you're, you're too nice. You have to be ugly to me. Okay. <laughs> if you, you want to, to win. ugly to you. Okay. <laughs> Let's try this. I was talking to her, not to you. <laughs> um, I just you're also... A journalist. <laughs> I'm aware. Oh, no, no, no. I'm a nice person. Uh, um, I just also wanted to say I totally agree with uh, what Ernesto said. Uh, and I think this is also necessary to to consider always what mistakes have been made already uh, in the development we have seen and to learn from them. Um, and uh, if you look, for example, and, and, and this is also has also already been mentioned, the situation in, 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 in media is so totally different country by country, mm. so that it's nearly impossible from our perspective, and I would never do this, to give, for example, an, an answer to the situation in, in an African country, how you convince, can convince the media there. I, I just don't have an, an answer because I don't know the way your media, for example, is working, what, what key players you have, what, what the main issues are. So this is something you have to find out. We can exchange some ideas, but I could never give you a solution how you have to work with media there. 
uh, if I don't know the situation. If, if I can say something about European media and specifically about the German situation, and um, I just wanted to mention one other aspect. If we look at the way the, the total perception of renewable energy worked in Germany, it was uh, for many years, uh, how to say it, um, there was no media work nearly necessary yeah, because there was such a big credit from media to see renewable energy positive and to and to report on it that that even the spokespersons from the associations or from the big companies they they could just sit in their office and wait uh, until somebody is calling and asking them to give them some information so they they didn't need to do any active work so this has changed significantly and this is also the reason uh, why uh, it is getting more difficult, um, more time consuming, more expensive, whatever. Uh, and it's getting more complicated because the simple messages don't work anymore. Yeah? You have to find more complex answers. So th th this is my remark in, in, in this direction. And then to Rainer, who, who, who said he wants to be on the, on the top side of, of build siting, the Zeitung um, in Germany, I would say, yes, this is a good idea and we should try it. But don't forget that most people in Germany get their information from small media directly from, from, their, from their region. And this is how they make up their opinion. Uh, by reading this normal little newspaper every day at home. So, and, and this means really hard work to get into these papers and to, to, yeah, to, to influence your opinion there and to, to look specifically at the situation of the media representatives in this so little and not so important and um, 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 shining, shining media. Just a, just a short answer. My idea is not to have everybody get the information from Bill Seidling. This would be a catastrophe. I say so the Bill messages must be so like a, easy. They, must be, they must be so easy know. that they fit uh, in these short messages. This is the point. And three-word messages also go good with local newspapers. Okay. Um, so, thank you very much. Rainer Christoph, it's your yes, turn. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, so, I totally agree. Um, to Alexandra, who said uh, that we are lacking stars, um, like we are lacking the movie. Actually, there is a movie in Germany about the energy vendor. Nobody knows that. It's, 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 it could be better. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, so uh, the attempt has been made. But I would uh, extend the view, the, the view on stars. Um, it must. It, it does not have to be Hollywood necessarily. Um, I would be total, totally happy if you would have any political star in German parliament uh, who is in favor for renewable energy on a really high level and not, not only because it's a political opportune. Um, we had one or two, Hermann Scheer is uh, one of them. Um, and uh, I think that those people who are really convinced in renewable energy and which have a, a very good standing and their own way to explain things and to create a vision about the future development of renewable energy or the energy system as a whole, they could help a lot. And um, I personally, uh, I'm, 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 I'm really sad about uh, Hermann um, Scheer uh, faded away and or passed away. And uh, there, there's a gap and it could be really a mission to find a new uh, proponent, proponent for renewable energy in, within the parliament. Right now, it's more or less a ministry business and that comes with a lot of detailed and complex issues and huge, debate and, uh, huge debates and that's totally okay. But we are lacking someone with a big vision. Okay, um, before I open, thank you very much, Christ, Christoph. Before we open up for a, for, for a second round of, of questions, I would, um, since I am, you know, the, um, the bad journalist guy, um, put, put some water into, into your wine um, and, and, and tell you my now personal story, and, uh, which reminded me after Alexandra said, where's, where's the movie? 
uh, of course, this this El Gore movie. Is it's not a movie? You know, his 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 speech. But um, about five years ago, I, I was um, asking the same question, but from the filmmaker side of point of view, because I am a filmmaker. And f at the Berlinale, which is the, um, the big Berlin um, film festival, all of you know, we designed together with the Heinrich Böll Foundation um, um, a speed dating thing between filmmakers and NGOs. It was not only renewable, but also renewable and human rights and all so on. So all the NGOs came together and I called it the Ho Lonely Hearts Club because movie filmmakers and movie makers, they need stories and you have a story, but, uh, but, but not a film. And in the end of the two days speed dating thing, which was really good, all the NGOs said, no, 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 we, we cannot make a manifesto. Well, because uh, now it's too difficult and our organization is, uh, is a standalone thing. So no, 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 I'm sorry. So I mean, and, and, and it wasn't the filmmakers, yeah? it was the NGOs. Maybe it's different in the, in the, in the renewables um, sector, but since um, you talked um, about this fight between, between the two organizations you, you brought together, that's one of the things I wonder myself, um, are you on the a, on a same track, all of you? And uh, do you really want that? Because then a filmmaker, of course, makes, makes, an, makes a known story, and you cannot only rely on Hermann Scher, who is, of course, it's, it's, it's awful that he died, but he was already there. It was like, you know, he was not 30 years old. Yeah? So you know that for, for, for years. So um, what's the real effort? So just, you know, what's the real effort to, to say, yeah, we have to go there? Um, uh, and, and talk to the, as you said, uh, you know, we have to, to, to reach the kitchen desks and not only the tabloids, which I think is, is an important point. So um, how to work with the media, but you know, I would maybe add the question, how to, how to reach the people, and not only how to work with the media. Did, you know, since I'm a journalist, so um, um, I don't know the answer, but maybe let, let, let us discuss this for, for the next half an hour, maybe. What can we do, uh, or what can you do to, to um, get to the next level? Laura, would, will you uh, Hannah, Hannah, I just sorry, wanted to sorry. say, yeah. add something. Mm -hmm. You're right mm -hmm. that uh, there have been some films. Mm -hmm. uh, I know this because we, we, mm -hmm. I've seen them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, some smaller films, um, also some fiction films, but they haven't been no blockbusters. Mm -hmm. yeah? And there has been also a novel, maybe you know it, Ian McEwan, Solar. Uh, I thought you meant Frank Schätzing, der Schwarm. No, no Solar is about okay. a okay. solar okay. scientist. Mm -hmm. uh, um, this is a very nice novel from a very famous uh, author. Uh, maybe you have heard of it. So, but the story is mainly about, and this is, I guess, what makes the difference is about this character. So, uh, the novel is about this specific character and about his um, absurdities. Mm -hmm. uh, and the fact that he is also a solar scientist is just a part of the story. But you get a lot of information about the solar industry in this novel. Um, um, then what I think is really remarkable, because I have been monitoring this for many years, is in German TV, for example, you see in German TV productions, in some crime series or whatever, crime stories, Tatort is very famous, you see pretty often scenes where people are moving through the landscape and as all of a sudden they are standing next, uh, next to a wind turbine or to a solar plant or whatever. And this is a sign for me that Gradually, renewable energy is uh, just part of our normal life and that you see this also in films. You see this in ad campaigns much more than 10 years ago. Uh, you have the motives of, of especially of wind energy and solar in a lot of just normal brand advertising campaigns uh, in, in Germany. I've seen it very often in the last 10 years and it's getting more and more. And this is. Um, for me, this is a hopeful sign that this is getting much more part of our daily life. Uh, if people from from absolutely different industry take this as a as a sign of uh, innovation um, and, and and modern life, whatever, yeah, that that it is part of this kind of storytelling. Okay. Um. Just Kelly, and then it's up to you. Uh, you want to add? Oh, so Kelly would like to make a remark, and then it's um, open up to you again. Well, lady, you get the chance right away, Helen. I mean, I, I think that the quality of a good movie, there has to be drama. And it's kind of hard to imagine how you make something a, a big drama, emotional, morally compelling, powerful story just about renewables. It doesn't, I, I don't, I mean, I'm as big an advocate as anyone, and I can't hardly see it. But if you think about demonizing the other side. There are lots of great examples. I mean, I'm just thinking about, you know, Silkwood, 
you remember with Meryl Street playing um, Karen Silkwood. I mean, that was just, they were so evil, the nuclear industry. Or what was that, that series in the UK, what was Edge of Darkness or something? That, I mean, it was really this gripping thriller in which you cast the nuclear industry in, in the evil power role. And you can do the same thing with oil companies. And I think, you know, what happens in those kind of stories quite often is they always have the token, you know, green piecer who's looking like a sort of a 60s hippie you know, who's kind of a caricature or the caricature, you know, we have, to, I think what we have to do is figure out how to insert the positive message in there without making it just look silly, trivial, or a caricature, but somehow that's relevant. But I just think these stories are going to be more about demonizing the other side than about the movie about renewables, if you want it to be something that the public is going to actually go see. Okay, great. Thank you very much. I think um, Alexandra, you and me will sit um, together tonight and to talk about the script. But now, um, uh, but now there are a lot of hands up. Um, so where to start? Um, where? Okay. Oh. Okay. Uh, we we got all of you, so um, maybe just name an organization and then um, the question. I'm, I'm Craig Morris. I'm an independent writer and analyst, and I suppose a campaigner in, in my heart. Um, I would just like to say, as, as someone who was born in the States um, but has spent ha more than half of his life in Germany, that I understand uh, the discussion about um, we need to play dirty or do we need to play dirty. Um, I would just say that uh, since we have the arguments on our side, um, we can only win by making this debate honest and keeping it respectful. Uh, we will win the, the more honest this, this goes. Um, and you can see that from Germany. This is why, and I'm not trying to, I, I have a lot of respect for Steve's work. And of course, as an American uh, living in Germany, I can understand how easy it is for me to say this because uh, I don't deal with this uh, quite on, a re on the same regular basis. Um, but we will, you know, when I get attacked on Twitter um, and called a propagandist and all that, I usually just respond by saying, well, at least I'm not a name caller. Um, what I do not agree with is this idea that everyone in this room is nice and that we're all a, a really good community. I think there's some improvement to be made there. Um, I would describe us as uh, potentially nice, uh, but also quite fractious, uh, a group of uh, potentially competing organizations uh, that could work more together. Um, and when new ideas come into your organization, is the first question or the overriding question uh, how does this fit our mission? Or is it, how does this promote, how would this promote the greater ideal and movement that we are some small part of? Thank you. Thank you very much, Greg. There are a lot of hands up at the moment, so I would like all of you now um, make a brave, but maybe also brief remark or question because we have so many that otherwise we can't collect. Okay, so we try to get most of you um, questions right now. All right. Thank you very much. My name is Karen Reis. I work for the ECOWAS Center for Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency in Praia. And um, I'd like to comment on, on three messages that have been made, um, pointing out it is indeed very important that we need a different approach in the countries that we work in. We have, uh, I would say, provocatively, we have enough drama there. What we need is uh, good success stories. Uh, to be shown, to be demonstrated by political leadership. I think this is where we try to focus on our communication from ECRI a lot, to highlight um, those countries on the regional level that have, that have uh, shown success stories, that have uh, taken up um, a good path and try to get others on board. So I, I believe in the, in, the, in the good way of communication and I think this is um, one of the success stories uh, of ECRI's uh, communication. Thank I you try very to much. be brief. Thank, Thank you very you. much, Tana. Okay, um, there are a lot of questions in, in the front as well. Okay, yeah. We try to collect them all. Ah, okay. Uh, well, a question and a comment, Raffaele Piria, energy policy expert. Um, first uh, comments, uh, Germany is not the only country where the energy transition is working well. Actually, Italy has more solar and PV energy, Ireland and Denmark have more wind, Israel has more solar heating, 
And this is very important because Germany has a positive image, so it's a very important champion, but also not only a positive image, and it's very important to, to extend the number of uh, model countries. On the other side, I have the impression that we should be talking here about global communication. Uh, every country is very different, and uh, the common points at the end, today at least, are still the English, the international English-speaking medias, which, uh, and that's a problem because there is an intertwining between the fact that uh, people like the Wall Street Journal or the Economist or the Financial Times uh, are very rich, so you need a lot of money to address them, and we, are, we don't have it. And they are intertwined with the national debates of uh, countries like the UK and the United States mainly, which from the point of view of, for example, climate skepticism are actually quite isolated and backward. And there is, I don't know where the cause and the effect is, but we should be addressing this, this intertwining and these two countries. They are actually isolated, their, their debates are isolated, and, uh, but they influence the world. Okay, great. Um, now we make something like we have so many questions, so um, you take this side, I take this side, so we get as much as possible, because otherwise we're running out of time. Starting here, and then... Yes, hello. I'm, I'm one of those colleagues that uh, Laura has mentioned who's working at the REN21 Secretariat, Martin Hallen, and I wanted to actually give one remark and uh, also connect this to a question, because I think one point that we see during the discussions that are happening now here, and that was the whole idea of facilitating this discussion, is that we are generally talking about our renewable energy sphere. And if I give you one example, I mean, a hundred years ago, there was a fight ongoing. There was a company called Ford that had a new product that was very sexy, but they didn't have any money to get it out in, into the open, and there was a subsidiary of uh, Stato. So what do they do? They made oil sexy. They had a product that was easily understandable and that was put out there. And who was the big guy back then? It was Westinghouse, it was Edison. It was, those were the big, big companies that were 20, 30 years, were selling electricity, people were excited about it. And do we have electric cars driving around? No, because there was funding available. And there was a cross-sectoral cooperation of combining not only the fossil fuel, but also a sexy product that was using it. And if we look today, 2014, do we have corporations of Tesla with renewable energy that is generating this electricity? Do we have outreach between those different stakeholders? No. And I think this is also a lesson that can be learned that has worked once with a uh, commodity that's by far not as nice a topic as uh, the renewable energy we're talking about. Basically. Thank you, Martin. Now, um, some more questions. Can you come? It's not a question. I had three hand three short comments. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Indian commercial entertainment industry, movie industry. One thing we have achieved, instead of letting the boy run around with the girl around a tree, we have made them run around wind turbines. And it's giving a clear message that wind turbines have come to stay. And we have got the hero to bash up the villain on solar panels. I mean, this is again a new revelation. People start asking, what is this wind turbine? What are the solar panels? And we have asked all these wind energy companies to take the school children on their daytime outings or picnics to these renewable energy sites. It's a process of education we have started. And the second observation I had to make is in India, we do not uh, deliberately badmouth conventional power industry because they have the money power to bash us up. So we keep quiet, we stealthily, strategically, we talk about the advantages of renewable, but we don't say that coal energy is bad or nuclear energy is bad. I mean, it is bad, but there's no point in saying that because we don't want to get beaten up. The third thing is uh, the issue of renewable industry, intra-renewable jealousies and fights. Some people say wind is better than solar, another person says solar is better than wind, and biomass will give you 24-7 power, whereas solar will work only for 20% of the time. I think it's high time we pack our intra-renewable jealousies and fights in, in the background and talk about renewables in general. That's all I wanted to say in coming. Thank you very much. Now um, you have the word, Helen Connor. Um, thank you. Maybe it's no longer the time of asking whether we should be nice or uh, nasty. We know we are winning. Renewable energy is unavoidable now. Maybe we can afford to elevate the debate and show better uh, what renewable energy future is going to bring us. Mm -hmm. 
very quickly. It's going to be a very different future. It will have benefits that uh, we are looking for. Distributed energy is bringing more democracy, more transparency. We are going to get out of those oil wars and competitions. So if we show better, if the media help us show better what type of future we want to have with renewable energy, I think we elevate the debates and we leave the nasty part to others. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. So I have a comment uh, written down from this gentleman. What about education to inform students by a uh, severe, sorry, your, your, my, my hand running. By a series of, oh, a series, a series of success stories will spread the real message into families and the normal public. Thank you very much. And uh, first the lady and then you. Okay. Don't try to give a microphone. Okay. okay. Yes, my name is Esther Prudence Uego. I'm from the René Lemoine Institute, it's a research institute of renewable energy. So I would like to say that uh, many people are talking about the bad story concerning renewable energy. But when we consider the other energy sources, they don't only, only have successful story. They also have bad story. They are causing, for example, many incendies from the diesel generator or many other damage and nobody is talking about it. But if you are looking for something in internet, for example, concerning renewable energy, you will just see the bad story. Maybe we sometimes have the feeling that the media are against renewable energy. Or maybe it's also because uh, when we are working, we do not think about to mediatize what we are doing because we always have successful story, but nobody is thinking about it. The solution could maybe uh, be that we should integrate the mediatic communication in our work as a part of our work and communicate all the time about what we are doing so that people will have information when we are looking for. And if there are still those bad stories, they will be free to decide about what to do. Thank you very much. Esther, one more final question. And it's up to you, Johannes. You're s yeah, smiling prettily, not ugly. Um, so, what's your remark or question? So, yeah, I'm Johannes Meyer from Fraunhofer IC. I'm a scientist there, and um, I've recently read uh, a study from Duke University. Um, it was a psychological study in the U.S., and um, they looked at why um, many politicians from the conservative party um, tend to deny uh, the issues of climate change, and uh, what they find out is they don't mistrust the science, but they don't like the solution that is connected with it, like restriction, taxes on carbon, because they are related to more like liberal or uh, left party um, instruments. So I think it's very important to develop um, conservative solutions or um, bring the message. And then I come back to the point I had before. I think it's very important to cr um, like focus on business opportunities and really show that um, renewable energy is a solution that can save a significant amount of money on a national level in the future and the times of very high prices is already over and um, if we can make this happen I think um, we, yeah, we will be successful. Great, thank you very much um, for this uh, remarks so a lot of impact we have right now. Let me just um, make one more poll here talking about media and so on. I wonder um, whom of you would say is an expert in renewable energies and technology and so on. Hands up. I hope everybody. I mean, that's why you're here. Um, yeah. So, uh, okay. Whom of you uh, would say is a media expert or has in his organization like um, Minimum one media expert or media section or communication section. Okay, okay, that shouldn't be the problem then. Okay, it's more than a half because I I, I would um, raise the question whether you know it's it's enough media um, competence already in the organizations. As you said, Laura, for example, you're only four four people in one twenty one, like the guerrilla group of renewables. Um, um, but um, yeah, let's start. There are a lot of lot of questions and remarks. Um, Laura, up to you. Yeah, ah, yeah that's right. <laughs> I have the power. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> that's worse. Yeah. 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 <laughs> that's right. You know, I was listening to the various comments. I mean, I. I I don't know if I can respond to any of them specifically. I mean, I think for me, um, and I put this out there, and maybe I'm going to dera de derail what, what you're intending to do, so if I do, I apologize. I mean, for me, I would like to hear 
practical action. Yeah. I want to know what we can do better. I mean, we have, I have some suggestions about what we do at REN21 that I'm you know, happy to, to share, my five sort of recommendations. But I'd like to hear what other people have done and what has worked. Okay, we don't have a huge communication budget. I mean, Christine is not going to walk in tomorrow and say, Laura, you've got a half million euros, do what you want. No, it doesn't exist. So we have to work with what we have. And I'd like, my request, my desire would be for us, as one organization, to be more efficient and more effective with the resources we have. And I think the talent is in the room, I think the knowledge is in the room, and it's really a question of how do we build those alliances and how do we draw on each other's expertise to amplify the message. You know, do I work with Kelly's organization because she's got campaign experience? I work with someone else because they've got, you know, PR, they know how to do the spin. Um, somebody else because they've got the great data that can, that can back up the simple one, you know, three word facts. That's what I'm really interested in, in hearing. The really practical stuff we can do now um, to get the message out. Thank you very much. Um, Kelly, you have, you have the microphone, you have the power and the word. Um, just as you are the PR, uh, well, all of you are the PR experts, but you are our keynote speaker. One real question, not a rhetoric one for me. Do you really need the big money to win the war, as you say, or is it more, you know, better ideas and better, braver hearts? Because, you know, this David and Goliath thing, do, is it only about money? There is, for example, um, in, in this digital world, this first kiss video, most of you know, there are, you know, like these videos, they don't cost any money, but they're really just good, and everybody sees that. For example, this was just for a... For, for, um, um, Taylor thing, like, you know, people, strangers kissing each other for the first time for the camera. It became a hit on the internet, like, with, and it didn't cost anything. So it is possible to start campaigns without money, in my opinion, but maybe it's wrong, and you say, we need the big money, and we have to be the Goliath, and not the David, to win. What do you think? Okay, I had a, a couple of comments, but mm. I'll answer that one first. Right. We're never going to win by being the Goliath. We can't. So we have to be the David. In my very first week on the job as a campaigner in 1982 was when, uh, under Ronald Reagan, James Watt had proposed um, basically opening up the entire offshore, outer continental shelf to offshore development in the United States. There was something like five billion acre, million, eight, I don't remember, I'm bad with numbers. I, I shouldn't be one of your number people. Um, huge amount of acres to be put up for sale. Greenpeace. One guy came with a bucket of marbles, like I think there were like 5,000 of them or something like that, to the Department of Interior, brought cameras with whatever, knocked on the door and said, we're here to deliver these marbles to Mr. Watt, who's clearly lost his. You don't know if you know the expression to lose your marbles or to go crazy. So um, they said, oh, well, we can't, uh, you know, he's in a meeting, whatever, you don't have an appointment. He said, okay, well, I'm delivering. And he dumped the marbles on the floor. And these marbles, it was a marble floor building, and they bounced everywhere, and they went everywhere. And the security guard was running around saying, watch out, watch out, don't step on Mr. Watt's marbles. Well, that <laughs> picture went in every single newspaper in the country. It was a huge news story, and it cost, what, probably $30 in yeah. Yeah. marbles? So, no, you don't, you, you don't need a lot of money to do this. You have to be creative, you have to be smart, you have to, you know, be prepared to do something a little bit dramatic. I, I don't think I heard anyone say that we need to fight dirty like they fight dirty. I think that's an example of fighting dirty in a way that is authentic and is heroic. We need to be clever and smart and unafraid to stand up for what we believe in. So there's that. Secondly, your comment about um, coming up with arguments for the other side, you know, that, that work for conservative people. I mean, what the liberal, liberal in the sense of the right-wing conservatives don't like are taxes and big government which is why the whole cap and trade thing came out in the first place. That was the conservative solution, but they didn't like that either. So I think we make a mistake if we think we're ever going to convince those people to be on our side. We're not. And we're never going to convince that, you know, the first category of journalist I mentioned, the Murdoch types. They have an agenda. They have an opinion. We're not going to change their values. We're not going to change them. So we need to focus on changing um, those journalists who just don't know better. Uh, we need to reach to the people who don't already have their minds made up. So I think that 
uh, as I said in my speech, we need to have a communication strategy which does that. So in terms of your suggestion of having practical things, all those people who raised their hands and said they had a comms officer in your organization or whatever, why not get a group, get all those people together and try to come up with a broad-based communication strategy which looks at these big questions. And that's not gonna apply in every country, in every region, in every fight. But if you had that broad-based one, maybe from that you could, you could make that available to people and then specific ones could be drawn which were then relevant to that local region. I think that would be a great resource and I think just the fact of having that conversation amongst all of the comms people would probably be quite a productive discussion. And already very practical, as you said, practical advice. Now, now I don't uh, take your microphone. You have yours, uh, Hannah, uh, uh, Christoph. You like, you like to start? Yeah. Um, I agree to you, Kelly. And uh, I think it's important to get the swing journalist mm. um, and how to do that. And why are they swing journalists? I mean, they receive stories from different sides, um, from the fossil fuel and fossil, uh, from the fossil system, from the renewable system, and they are irritated. And they are even more irritated when they receive different messages from, from the renewable side, which occurs too. So I agree to you, Craig, that this is a problem. And uh, maybe that's also a point where we can find a solution just by sitting together with all the different stakeholders within the renewables community and find messages everybody um, can use out of this community. This would preventing the, the confusion at the journalist side and could be one brick um, to get the swing journalist back or to get the swing journalist on your side. Okay, thank you very much, Christoph Hannem. I also agree. Mm -hmm. hmm? Sorry to say um, this. Not, yeah, I'm not sorry, but yeah, because yeah, yeah. absolutely right what you said. Nobody's and fighting. Everybody no, is agreeing. I'm That's sorry really boring for this. And, yeah. <laughs> and, and I also also say there is no reason to to try to fight against uh, the the big oil and gas companies concerning campaigning because you will not never have this kind of budget that they have um, and. It's also the question whether it really makes sense to spend all this money on ads, for example, that they do, because they just do this to, to polish their image, and it is necessary that the image is polished, and this is something you don't need to do. Uh, it is much better, much more effective to put more emphasis on content. So, because we haven't been talking that much about the situation that uh, that media is facing globally and, and, and of course, in, in various countries and on, on different levels. That means that the, the whole digital movement in the media sector is changing the role uh, of a journalist, is changing the, this, the, how does the setting of the kind of media that you have dramatically. So, we have two... Uh, parallel transformation processes going on and that means that that the the profession of a journalist is so much under pressure in, in many many countries and there is so little budget now in, in, in a lot of editorial teams that they are pretty thankful if you come up with good and trustful and, and how to say it, uh, information and, and products that can be used directly. So it is much more easy, um, it's, it's much more easy to, to, to do media work today than it has been 10 years ago because you have, have so to say, you have a, a goal group of people who are really thankful if you come up with, with good information. So that is also a plaidoyer for organizing yourself better, thinking about what you can, what are the kind of messages that you want to distribute globally and then also to think about country specific yeah, strategies. Yeah, yeah, sure. yeah, yeah, okay. So now, okay. Just, just a second, just okay. to hook in. Yeah, okay. Is, is that so, okay? Yeah, yeah, Laura okay. wants a second, you want a second, and Ernesto wants a second, but okay, start. Uh, yeah, okay. everyone wants a second, it's, it's, start. It's, it's really uh, just to, to hook in. There are already providers who are doing that. The sister organization of Agora, it's called the Clean Energy Wire, is pr providing information on the German energy vendor in English language that's, that comes for free with a daily service, and you are all invited to subscribe to that. It's comes for free and uh, just go to uh, ah, cleanenergywire.org, okay. uh, I think. So that's all I wanted to say. You, you wanted to have like a 
PR break for yourself. Great. It's okay. Not, no, 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 of course. It's, it's, it's for the for the good for thing. Me. It's not for me, and it's <laughs> All right. uh, with, without a buyer. So. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Laura gets the micro and then Ernesto. <laughs> and just building on what you were saying, Han, you know, REN21 got a Google grant for AdWords, and it was amazing the changes that happened mm. with regards to people who um, clicked on it, who came to our website, who then maybe went to other websites that were doing with renewables. And that was something that didn't cost us anything. Yes, you know, we had to apply and we had to demonstrate what we were doing, but it was exactly what you were saying. It was an avenue that um, has really driven people to our website and our information, and it didn't cost us anything except a little bit of time to put in an application and then to, again, discipline ourselves to do the work, to put in the words, to, to use it as a, as a tool. Thank you very much. Ernesto, now, now it's well, your turn. Thank you for the word. First of all, uh, I will tell you, it's not a second, but I will tell you very, very, very go to the point. Uh, first of all, I think this is an excellent initiative to talk about communications, but on the other hand, it's very challenging because obviously it depends on the level we are talking. For example, REN21 is doing an excellent job uh, as a worldwide level and trying to to make influence on uh, different stakeholders. But many times, communication in renewals is very endo endogamic. We talk ourselves, you know, we talk each other. We can, ma many times we are not able to really reach what we want. And I would really like to focus on the specific case in my country, because the thing has been changing year by year. In 10 years or 15 years ago, the situation was absolutely different. So the messages were different. And my concern is that uh, the civil society, I mean the people who can make an influence on what? On politicians that make the regulations. The regulations were changed and then after that change, but not because of the popular pressure, not because we are not that strong. I understand we need to reach the media and the media can translate the, the, the messages to the public and the public can put some pressure on the politicians. Fortunately, today, we don't need, for example, in Spain, in the PV sector, even to really go for feeding tariff system, because we don't need it. But even though, you know, we have one of the most relevant problems we have had in the last few years is lack of union among different players in the country. You know, if you talk to the people from photovoltaic and wind and, and uh, solar thermal, ah, they are fighting each other. They really don't want, they really don't find common messages. And, uh, and the weakness, and uh, coming back to your point, we have somebody in front. The utilities, basically, in developed countries, because the messages in developing countries are absolutely different. But in developed countries, it's absolutely clear that the centralized generation is nothing, it's not, it's not something that the utilities want. So they are fighting strongly against it. And that's something we need to understand. So how we can really build these messages to really reach to the, not the utilities, but the government to really stop the utilities blocking the develop of a renewable energy, that, that's, that's the key point. So in every case, in every country, I understand it's a different issue and the stakeholders are different and the pressure coming from the utilities, for example, is different. And uh, so uh, that's why I think we should be building messages depending on the, on the places, on, on the time, and, and the evolution of technologies and so on and so that. So it's, it's very complex. Okay. Thank you very much, Ernesto. Exactly. Thanks, Laura, for taking the power. <laughs> um, um, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to come to the final round with our four panelists. Uh, I learned a lot already. But since we were um, not only about ugliness and, and, and beauty of uh, renewables, but since we're talking about the myths and, and storytelling and storylines uh, for the last two hours, I would like you um, for the, your final statement to um, write with words down your personal story until 2050, maybe earlier. It can be a campaign, it can be ugly or pretty, it can be a movie for Alexandra and me, it can be something else, but what is your your new story or you know the story um, for the next 10 or 20 years you would like to you you would like to write if you have the power to do and all the money being the the david or the goliath whatever christoph would you like to start ah yeah ah, yeah yeah yes your personal will, will it be an ugly or a pretty story 
I would like to write the story oh. on the success, mm -hmm. the final success of renewable energy, and I'm pretty sure that we will, that we can write the story that renewable energy are the cheapest option to generate electricity, to provide fuel for mobility and also for heating, um, just because they are the most um, cost-efficient solution and with the side effect that they protect the climate and they give us security of supply. So that yeah, is story. my thank favorite story. Favorite Probably story. I'm not alone with that. Okay, thank you. Christoph Hannem, what kind of story, campaign or movie would you like to write? Pretty difficult, yeah, okay. because there are so many issues you but could write German, on. that's German, that's fine. That's a German film. <laughs> it's a German film. Yeah. I would like to, 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 to have a story which is called The End of the War or something mm -hmm. like this, because we have heard that there's so much fighting going on at the moment, it seems, especially in Germany, that there is a big fight. And I strongly believe that uh, the solution uh, to, to, to fulfill the energy transition in, in Germany is not fighting, but peace and to find solutions for for all the players that we have in the market right now. We have been discussing this just before this panel that we said uh, for in, in the electricity sector, for example, in Germany, I'm, I'm pretty convinced that the solution, there has to be a solution which includes also the utilities. So they will still be there in 2020 and 2030. So they will have a different role. Um, they, they will be smaller, they, they will be different, but they will still be there. And we also will have much more uh, normal people who will be owners of uh, solar plants, owners of wind turbines, and so on. So we have a more democratic system, a more di diversified system. We will still have some big players. They will have a different role. Uh, and all in all, this, this new system will be more cost efficient, it will be more effective, and it be much more stable uh, than the old system that we have. This is the positive story that I would write. Thank you very much, Hanne. Um, you have the power and the possibility to create. What's your story? Kevin? Okay, I'm pretty sure that by 2050 I'm going to be dead, so I'm going to put this as one of my children writing this story, and I hope they will still be thriving at that stage. And I think that, um, you know, by 2050, there are studies which suggest that if we really want to have a really good chance of staying below two degrees and even a possibility to get to 1.5 degrees, we would have had to have completely. Uh, made the transition to 100% renewables by 2050. So I guess my headline would be the fact that we did that and that we managed to stave off the most absolute worst catastrophic impacts of climate change, that we man barely managed to dodge that bullet despite the fact that by 2050 we'll probably be seeing some very extreme weather and unpleasant consequences anyway. But the, the idea that we somehow managed to make that transition in time to prevent the complete breakdown of civilization would be my positive story. Great. I knew you're a good scriptwriter, and we will talk about your role in your movie uh, later on. Laura. <laughs> uh, I don't do very well thinking on my feet, unfortunately. Um, mine would be Get Smart. I think for me, it would be the story of um, the technological transformation that renewables can bring, both from technology development, from an environmental perspective, particularly with regards to health, um, air and water, but also about really shifting how we uh, learn and interact with our environment and the role that renewables, the catalytic role that renewables can play in that process. Thank you very much, Laura. So four stories to, to, um, to be written. Let me tell you at the end um, of this panel called Debunking Myth About Renew Renewable Energy, oh my God, um, one of my favorite myths, maybe I rewrite the whole thing in using myth. Uh, for renewable energies. You probably know the myth of Sisyphus, the guy who had to carry up um, um, a big stone to a mountain because he was condemned by the, by the gods, and he had to um, carry up the, the, the big stone all the time. Um, and uh, and in the moment um, the, the stone was up the mountain, it was clear that it was, you know, go down and roll down again, and he had to do it again and again and again and again. And the French philosopher Albert Camus, he asked a very good question, why doesn't Sisyphus commit suicide, knowing that he has to roll up uh, the mountain all the time, um, the stone to the mountain all the time. 
And then in his essay, he comes to the conclusion that um, there is one moment when the stone balances up there on the mountain. And this is exactly the moment and the second, we're talking about seconds here, the second when he has won against the gods. It's his moment and he's the winner. So take this, take this miss, uh, wait for the moment and make it last. I know you can win. Thank you very much. <laughs> Laura, Kelly, Christoph, Hannah, thank you very much um, for this great story and great advantage. Now the next 10 minutes um, before the lunch break you can use, uh, not for your myth, but for the photos you can still take. Um, with or without costume, since you know this is a religious <laughs> holiday, uh, Jenny will be there. Take the photos if you don't have one yet, or um, you can even, yeah, yeah. Uh, and have fun. Yeah, see you later. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs>